Ugh. All right. Well, um, thank you for dealing with that delay, and thank you, everyone, for making it to the end of this conference. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of content shoved into your brains, um, and I want to give uh, thanks to Pat and Mike and everyone else involved with this effort for making it look so easy. Can we give them a round of applause, please? I'll start the timer. Um, so setting expectations, I'll be doing 180 slides. Uh, it's roughly six slides a minute. Um, this is a fluffy, non-technical talk. Uh, I seem to alternate between the two. Uh, my last talk here was uh, how to write an interpreter in 30 minutes. Um, so this will not be that. Um, this is not a history talk, and this is meant to be uh, informative, not necessarily inspirational. Um, so this is about information, and my slides are already published at the URL below. So, um, quick introduction. Um, oop. Um, this is me doing this without notes, and damn, this sucks. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, user groups today and study groups. And uh, one of the things I learned while talking to people around here is that there's about six user groups in the Salt Lake City area and surrounding area alone, and one of them got my attention. It's the Downtown Ruby Users Group. Uh, apparently, um, they refer to themselves as druggies, um, and being a graduate of the Evergreen State College, um, I felt really at home talking to these people. So, just a quick shout out to that group. Um, so, I co-founded CLRB in February of 2002. Uh, Pat Eiler was at the first meeting with me, so he is a co-founder of CLRB. Um, we were the first group to meet in the world for Ruby. Um, but one thing that's important about us is that we're constantly evolving. We're a dynamic group. We're not static. And we have worked to find what is the right balance for our attendees. Uh, like I said before, I find history talks dreadfully boring. Um, so this is not one of those. I'm instead going to be talking about the evolution of our group, not the dates and times and who is meeting and all that stuff. That's boring. Um, and I'm hoping to share, you know, a recipe for what works for our group and talk about the pros and cons and the trade-offs um, that those decisions have made for us. Um, every type of group has different flavors. Some groups are really big into doing presentations. Um, some groups, like ours, is really big into doing hacking. And some groups, like, uh, for example, San Francisco's, uh, are really big into the networking aspects and the business aspects. And there's, I'm sure, many, many others. We love doing and making, uh, and that's come in three main stages for us. Uh, we're currently evolved to be roughly three-quarters hacking and one-quarter talking slash sharing. Uh, but first, a quick little digression. Once upon a time, uh, there was a Canadian named Miles, and uh, he showed up to our group. And the first time that he showed up uh, and introduced himself, um, I noticed these nice round O's. And I said, what are you doing here? You're Canadian. Um, <laughs> and it turns out that um, the man had needs, and he really needed to be around other nerds and hacking with us, and he saw what we were doing, and he didn't have anything like that around him. And if you notice, he's actually quite a bit north of the Canadian border. Um, so he drove... After work, we meet on Tuesdays. After work, many times to come sit in a cafe with us and hack with us. Um, and that was after 9-11. So he was doing this with our border patrol. Um, so you know how deep-seated that need was for him to be around other nerds. Um, so he and I sat down and we talked about the CLRB recipe and what worked for us. And... I, I disseminated what I thought was the right thing at the time, and he took that with him, and he created uh, Fraser Valley Ruby Brigade. And despite the fact that it's a small town, it's outside of uh, uh, Vancouver, um, it totally worked. And they meet every week, and uh, they love it. So hopefully, um, what I'm sharing with you today will help you go home and make the group that works for you or help shape your group into what you really want for your, for your people. 
Um, while I was researching this, I found a bunch of groups that actually attribute uh, CLRB as the influence for the style of meetings that they do. Uh, and the ones that I really like, besides uh, the Fraser Valley uh, story, um, Potero Hill is a small, it's, it's a bump in San Francisco. It's a tiny neighborhood in San Francisco. And San Francisco has a very business slash networky uh, user group. And some of the people there were like, well, that doesn't work for us. So we're going to start one in our neighborhood. And we're going to do it uh, hack style and do it like CLRB does. And they do. And I love the fact that there's this, this overlap. There's this Venice diagram of the types of Ruby meetings you can have in San Francisco. And I guess there's like six circles for Salt Lake City. Um, and I would love to see a map of, of those things and how they work out. Um, so let's talk about uh, CLRB version 1.0. That was what I referred to as the plain vanilla meetup era. Uh, the period was monthly. Uh, the location was ad hoc. Uh, we met in crappy cafes. The first of which for us, aptly named, was Orifice, <laughs> A-U-R-A. Um, we met in various offices uh, like Robot Co-op and um, Omni Group and uh, later Amazon. And we met on, in various parts. And if you know anything about the weather in Seattle, you'll know how often we met in various parks. I believe it was three times. Um, and the format <coughs> was presentations. Um, and I want to note that uh, I have shrink to fit turned on. And for some reason, Keynote 6, for anything that's above about 200 point, just decides it's going to break words however it wants to. Um, so if you come across any that I forgot to fix, I left this one in, t in here on purpose to, to shame Apple. Um, please take the time to stop and read it aloud, exactly as it's written. So in this case, it'd be presanti uns. <laughs> Here's our, our slide. Anyone? I don't hear duh. Duh. Disorganized duh discussions. Um, so the pros of this were that we had a group. That in and of itself is lovely and amazing and um, in and of itself is, is all we really needed. We needed to be able to get together and meet. Uh, and for us, we had the first group. We didn't know it at the time, uh, but we were starting to pave the way for others to, to start up theirs. Um, and this is pretty much how I felt at the time. <laughs> so, hey, there we go. Uh, so what are the cons? Um, monthly means that scheduling really matters. If you miss one, you're going to be going for two plus months without. Um, and inconsistent location means it's harder to organize and prepare and harder to disseminate that information about. Everyone has to pay attention to the mailing list and figure out what's going on rather than just knowing that they can show up at a time and place and other nerds will be there. Um, it's hard to get speakers, especially then, because Ruby was new. We didn't know as much. Uh, there wasn't as much stuff to share other than the crappy, horrible projects we were working on at the time. Um, and it's harder to keep speakers. With such a small group, it's the same people talking over and over and over, and it's rather unrewarding being the only one month after month. And that was really key for the evolution from 1.0. Um, and workplace locations meant that security is a thing. I don't know about you, but I don't like anyone following me to the bathroom. I just want to be able to go use the bathroom. And in some locations, like Amazon, we had to be led into the front door. We had to be escorted to the meeting room. And if we ever needed to use the bathroom, we had to be escorted there as well. So this led to 2.0. The nerd party era. Um, and this is... Uh, a term coined by Shane Becker's, uh, at the time, girlfriend, and the name just totally stuck because it absolutely fit the way we felt about it. Um, the period was weekly. The location was uh, a consistent cafe. We um, have been doing the 2.0 long enough that we've spanned uh, two cafes now. 
um, and we're currently meeting at Vivace in Seattle, if any of you want to visit. Um, and you can attest that it's good coffee. Um, and the format is absolutely unstructured hacking. Um, there is no leader. There is no format. There is no nothing. You show up, you hack with others, you drink some coffee or you don't. You talk to people or you don't. You hack on stuff or you don't. We don't care. The pros of this are that weekly mean you can miss as many as you want and it's no big deal. You know you can just go to the next meeting the next week and uh, not miss out on anything. Um, and I think this is absolutely key to a successful group. Um, so being centrally located and being in a cafe makes it more accessible. You don't have to deal with the security things. Um, we're in a downtown location, so uh, everyone can get to us via public transportation. It's easy, and the bars is lowered as much as possible. Being unstructured means that it's low maintenance. I don't have to do anything. I have to show up. I have to buy a coffee. I have to open my laptop, and I have to hack. That's it. Uh, and the same is true for everyone else who wants to attend. Um, and that kind of throws some people. Um, personally, I don't think there are any cons. I love this. I absolutely love it. Um, but that could just be me. I definitely have um, my opinions about things. Um, so the cons <coughs> are that some people do seem intimidated by the format. Um, they walk in and they see a bunch of people mumbling to themselves or to each other, <laughs> tapping on laptops, and they're like, well, how do I participate? And by being there, they're participating. They don't understand that, but they think that it's supposed to be interactive or that someone's supposed to be showing them something, and it's definitely not that, um, so they don't like that. Or some people don't, just don't see the value without presentations. Um, like I said, uh, our group is oriented towards uh, doers and makers, and... Um, the people that show up who want to consume um, talks uh, don't necessarily fit that bill, and that doesn't mesh with them, and that's fine. Um, oh, right. Uh, Timing-wise, now would be the right time to pull the alarm. If anyone was here last year, I would have actually had a lead-up to that, but I don't have any notes. Um, so if anyone would like to go... No? Okay. <coughs> We need the strobe, too, because that drove me bonkers. Um, and that leads to 3.0. Um, so we had enough people that didn't like the fact that we were having presentations that we moved into a new era. And this is the Nerd Party Plus monthly social era. The period was weekly and monthly. Basically, uh, we meet every Tuesday. If it's the first Tuesday of the month, barring holidays and other weird conflicts, uh, we have our monthly social. Otherwise, we're going to do our hacking in a cafe. The location, nerd party at our usual cafe. And we have the social at an office named Substantial, uh, which is where Aja works. The format, it's our usual weekly nerd party. And then monthly, we have presentations with food and drink. It's about one quarter socializing in food. Uh, half talks. Uh, we do generally two half-hour talks and one quarter lightning talks. Now, I put quotes around that. Because apparently, if you're a noob, we have, um, we have uh, Ada Academy, and we have uh, Code Fellows in Seattle, and they are uh, pumping out as many fresh new programmers as they can. Um, but you hear the word lightning, and they duck for cover. So we have renamed it to Show and Tell. And by renaming it, we have actually made it more accessible, and we've gotten a lot more talks out of them. And it's actually really awesome, because they've brought some really good show-and-tells, I guess you call them, um, uh, to our meetings and been able to contribute, and we've been richer for it. So the pros. This is a nice balance between 1.0 and 2.0. It is a hybrid approach. Uh, and we're able to reach more and different people and more learning types as a result. The cons are that we do actually have to organize. Um, we have to recruit people to talk and get people you know, networking ahead of time to try to get those talks lined up. Um, we need to get speakers. Uh, I put quotes around that because personally, I think that the day that we don't have any talks whatsoever and people are a little befuddled by that, maybe they'll learn that the meeting is what they make of it, not what I make of it. Um, and as a result, they'll contribute more. Uh, and we do need to work with sponsors to get uh, food, drink, in our venue. 
Um, and luckily, we've been blessed by having that across the board. Um, and luckily, we're actually a big enough group now that we have enough people that some really enjoy organizing. It is very much not my bag. I want to show up, drink a coffee, and hack. Um, but like Pete really likes to organize our meetings uh, for our monthly socials, and we love him for that. Uh, and that brings us to 3.1. See, I told you I could do this in 20 minutes. <clears throat> Um, where we have added study groups to our usual thing. Um, the period for the study group is we do weekly before Nerd Party. We do not overlap it. Uh, the format is uh, evergreen-style seminar minus the weed. Um, <laughs> we pick a challenging book. Uh, we have done SICP, and for those of you um, who aren't quite getting the pattern yet through today, um, you're not paying attention. This is an important book, and you would be much better off if you studied it. Um, so in chapter one, you do square roots via Newton's method using simple functional programming. And one of the things that I really liked in Jim's presentation in, in uh, Goguruko is he pointed out that there's nothing really mentioning square roots in here. It just winds up being this approximation uh, via functional calls. Uh, and then we implement a metacircular interpreter in four easy chapters. <laughs> uh, there is a fifth chapter where you write a compiler for the metacircular interpreter, um, but this is where my love is, and this is where I, I was really working towards. Um, we did another book called Realm of Racket last fall, and in that we wound up writing um, a keyboard control spaceship that flies around. We wound up doing a two-player uh, Worms, uh, an RPG-ish type game, and even a networked multi-user game, all done in Scheme, uh, specifically Racket Scheme, which is actually a really lovely way to learn Scheme. Uh, and we're currently working on something called NAND to Tetris. Uh, the book is titled The Elements of Computing Systems by uh, Nissen and Schocken, and you wind up starting with the simple NAND gate, which is uh, what's called a universal circuit, and building up from that um, complex logic, and then an ALU, and then a CPU, and then memory, and then everything else that involves, is involved in your magic wizard boxes that are in your laps. Uh, we use a mailing list to communicate uh, non-face-to-face um, for organization. We generally meet in the same place, except for during our monthly socials we meet over near Substantial. Um, but we use that for um, disseminating the homework and everything else. Uh, we are self-organized. We have, actually have uh, multiple groups going in parallel now. And um, we have real homework every week. Uh, we generally do about a chapter a week. So the pros of this are learning. Duh. Um, and it's orthogonal to our regular nerd party. If we overlapped it, we'd lose people that would want to go to the regular nerd party because we'd be talking about some book they weren't interested in. And we'd lose some of the students who didn't want to deal with all the other stuff. So by making it orthogonal to the regular nerd party and making it just for them, yeah, we have more of a time commitment, but uh, it works out scheduling-wise much better. Cons, more time commitment, obviously. Um, and for me, the disappointment of seeing enthusiasm dissipate as people realize that what we're doing is actually work. Um, so we had 44 people sign up for the previous book, The Realm of Racket, which is about making games. So a lot of people are like, games! And so they all sign up. But then just 13 of them introduced themselves, and just nine actually organize a time and place. And only six of those meet, and only four have finished. And so this is my disappointment visualized. <laughs> You'll notice the, the very tight fit to the very awful negative power curve. Um, so what is the actual recipe for making a successful Ruby Brigade? First off, pick your participants. What type of group are you trying to make and who are you trying to meet for? What do you want to do? Um, food and drink will always win. If you announce that you're going to have pizza and beer, people will show up. Um, but they also bring a different type of participant. They're generally more passive. They want to watch talks, stuff like that. So do you want them? Maybe you do. Maybe that's exactly what you want. Uh, but then you lose other types. Um, you can't please everyone. So 
just figure out who you're trying to meet for and make that, and someone else can make a group on a particular hill in your neighborhood. Um, be passionate about it and be supportive. Um, we've actually had um, a lot of noobs come in through our doors over the years, uh, my favorite of which um, showed up with a copy of Chris Pine, uh, Learn to Program, uh, which is a great book for, for noobs. Um, sat down, got two pages in, turned to one of us and said, what's a text editor? And we're like, okay, we need to back up just a little bit and, and get you set up for this stuff. Um, and that's exactly the type of people we want. We want noobs to come in. We want them to ask questions. And we want to be able to support them because that's what we're meeting for. We want to hack and we want to help people. Um, so for our group, it's all about bringing a project, a question, a bug they want to figure out, um, or just show up and hang out with fellow nerds. Um, for the right type of balance, you want to work at multiple levels. Uh, we do hack nights, show and tell, and presentate. Oh, sorry, presenti ons. <clears throat> and you want to strike a balance that works for you. Most importantly, you want to have fun. Uh, the location does matter. Being downtown or in some central location makes it as accessible to other people as possible. Uh, but consistency matters more. No matter what, meet every week. By having that and by having a, a short period between, uh, missing out is not a big deal and you wind up having more people over time. Guarantee it. Um, so what makes a successful study group? Pick a book. I think having a physical book, I'm one of those people. I have bookshelves and they have paper on them. It's weird. Um, I think having a physical book actually helps, especially for the, the actual meetings um, because you can have people uh, pair up and point at things and talk about something that's physically in front of them. Um, but you also want to be able to have the accessibility of other formats because not everyone's a highly paid software engineer. Um, and so by having e-formats or whatever, like SICP is freely available. You can get it in a PDF um, or ebook format and put it on whatever. Um, all of that helps. Uh, make it challenging. If it's not hard, what's the point? It doesn't have to be hard, hard. You don't have to do rocket surgery. But it needs to be something that actually pushes you past your limits because you need that enthusiasm and you need the push to, to keep it going. Um, organize a group, um, but loosely organize it. You don't want to control it. You don't want to um, tell people where they're going to meet and when. You want to figure out what works for each subgroup. Um, get a mailing list for communication. We currently use Google Groups, and it sucks, but it probably sucks less than all the other alternatives. Uh, and meet every week. I think that is actually really important, um, especially for the studying part and especially for the homework part. If it was too far in between, you'd have too many people drop off. The power curve would be even worse. Um, Self-organize. Each group should do their own. We have one in Ballard, and we have one uh, on Cap Hill. And... Um, we're completely independent of each other. We happen to be working at roughly the same pace, but not quite. Um, but someone needs to lead each group. They need to decide the homework, and they need to be able to communicate that stuff out to anyone who missed the meeting or whatever. Um, but be okay letting people fade away. Life ensues. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't control it. So they're going to disappear, and they're not going to finish, and that's fine. Um, thank you. I actually have enough time that I can do a surprise lightning talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you haven't figured out, I love this book. Um, it has some of the best pedagogy of any nerd book I've seen, and it really does an excellent job of explaining how your wizard box works. Um, and actually, I really liked the previous talk because there's a lot of parallels between what you build in this book and what went to the moon. Um, I didn't know that before that talk. So you start with a simple NAND gate. A NAND gate is simply a not AND. Um, and it, like the NOR gate, is uh, unique in that they're called a universal circuit. You can build all other logic gates out of just them. Uh, <clears throat> so you use the NAND gate to build up the other gates. Um, since this is a not AND, you can feed a NAND to another NAND and not the not and wind up with an AND. Not too hard to figure out, but what is more difficult to figure out is that an XOR looks like this, uh, which is two knots going from left to right, two knots, 
two ands and an or. Um, and that looks like this. We're, we're building them up textually. It's just like regular source code, except that it's uglier, um, much uglier. And these represent those one-to-one. Uh, -one. We learn to optimize things. Um, this uh, XOR consists of a single NAND not, a two NAND and, a three NAND or, to total up to nine NANDs for its logic, or you work out the truth tables and figure out that four NANDs will do. That looks like this in HDL, and it's really no cleaner, uh, but there is less to debug. And you keep building on that <laughs> until you're building monsters like this, which is only a partial circuit, actually, uh, and I couldn't really get anything more complex because you wouldn't see a single pixel. <clears throat> Um, and you build up things uh, to the point where you're getting to real programmable logic, not just um, boring circuits. Uh, here's an ALU. It looks like that. It is, again, one-to-one. -one. Um, but I'm actually surprised that an that a arithmetic logic unit uh, only consists of this much. You use those to build up even more until you get to a CPU, which really just looks like this. And when you start to digest these things on a week-by-week -week basis and slowly build upon it, by the time you get here, it's not that big of a deal. And then you get to a computer when you realize there's only three things involved. What, the, what am I doing with all this complexity when there's only three things involved in a computer, a CPU, uh, some ROM, and uh, some memory? And it turns out that the memory is roughly on par with what went to the moon. So now I'm starting to think, well, maybe I could translate. No, that's crazy. <laughs> and, and there's, that's, no, don't. I've got enough projects, thank you very much. Um, and you wind up um, taking it from the hardware simulation uh, to a machine code specification that you write an assembler for. And then from that, you write a, uh, a, a VM intermediate representation, an IR um, format, and you build a compiler that compiles to assembly. And then on top of that, you build an O language parser and compiler that compiles to the VM intermediate representation. And on top of that, you write an OS, and you write uh, some games. And from there, you realize, starting from Pong all the way down, you've implemented every bit of logic that goes through the thing, and it's actually pretty digestible. And this book is, it's an inch. It's not, it's, it's much less scary than SICP, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> completely different, and they'll both bend your brains really well, so I actually recommend both books. But this is a lot of fun for me. I, I'm enjoying it a lot. Um, so, thanks to um, some coordination with Mike, I was actually allowed to extend my talk by an extra 30 minutes and keep you guys here. Uh, and I'll be giving my Let's Make a Computer in 30 Minutes talk. Woo! No, that's another talk. Uh, aw. Aw. <laughs> like I can fit that many more slides in. Um, so, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. <laughs>